I think we have a very interesting subject today, which is <clears throat> derived partly from the New Testament and partly from Chinese philosophy. That ought to make a very interesting blend. In the, the Bible, we are told that Jesus said to his disciples, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. On the other side of the world, Mencia says, the child heart is the most important thing in the world, and the loss of the child heart is the greatest tragedy of all. So that uh, this problem of the child seems to come into focus, especially in these days where there is so much uncertainty and discord in family relationships. We, if we go back to the philosophical concepts behind our way of life, we realize that this problem of the child has a very important key to the survival of humanity. We are inclined to feel that when a little child comes into the world, that it is a brand new little thing. That it never existed before. That comes here completely ignorant, unable to take care of itself, and most of all, actually unable to understand the policies of material existence. Therefore, for a considerable period of time, sometimes running as long as 25 years, the child must be conditioned. It must be taught how to fit in to a hopeless situation. It must be warned against those very principles which we most find in children. We know that very small children are usually adorable little creatures. They have their peculiarities and can be problems sometimes. But all in all, they are a wonderful adventure for young parents starting out in life. There is something about the small child that almost resembles the doll. It is almost a plaything. Gradually, it becomes the moral responsibility of the parents to mold the career of this little one. And being perfectly reasonable people and believing fully in the reality of the circumstances around them, they proceed to help the child to adjust itself to the peculiarities and eccentricities of modern mortal human existence. The parent has no idea that there's anything more to the subject than appears on the surface. The religious person believes the child in some mysterious way descends from God. The materialist considers it simply a physical phenomenon. Actually, the parent very seldom questions any of these things. It simply assumes that it has been given a responsibility, and if it is a good parent, it tries to fill that responsibility as honorably as possible. So the parent begins to work on what it believes to be a completely new character. Now it isn't long before this new character must be subjected to certain modifications. This little one is not completely a blank sheet of paper. It has a basic temperament and each member of the parental family is inclined to trace this temperament to the other member's family. <laughs> It is also assumed under the theory of uh, Mendelianism that uh, the child is now inheriting the burdens, responsibilities, problems, and miseries of perhaps several generations of ancestors. So all of a sudden the child doesn't even speak for itself. It opens its mouth and the grandfather's voice comes out saying all kinds of things the child would normally never have thought of. Nearly always these things that come out of the mouths of babes now have a peculiar ring to them. They seem to definitely imply that they belong to some type of previous behavior patterns which the parent must cope with to the best of their ability. Now the uh, alternate theory, of course, of reincarnation is very important at this point. I think we should all realize, if possible, 
that the life of, the, of an individual is not measured in one embodiment. A person's real lifespan is the cycle of embodiments through which he passes. He is therefore a being that exists in long periods of time. And in these long periods of time, he is periodically reborn. And in these rebirths, he brings into manifestation the achievements of previous embodiments and the unfinished business of the remote past. Therefore, without knowing it, without the parents knowing it, the child is some way conditioned before it gets here. The uh, next step is to realize that after it gets here, there is a period in which the child is simply incapable of, of expressing its own individuality to any great degree. In early infancy, the child is completely dependent. Therefore, depends upon the parents for survival, for nutrition, and to a measure for environment. This environment, however, is new even if the child believes in rebirth or is taught rebirth. It's new because a previous embodiment some time back, it was an entirely different social problem. The individual simply could not move from the 14th to the 20th century and simply live out one pattern of circumstances. The uh, 14th century is gone, yet the unfinished business lingers on. The environment of the 14th century no longer prevails, and the entire adjustment of the child to a physical environment must be contemporary. Therefore, out of an eternity and out of a past and out of a conditioning that is extended for ages, the child is dumped into our modern environment, into a world which has never, to our knowledge, existed before, a world in which values and circumstances are hopelessly confused. Therefore, the parent, or at least the educational system, or something or someone involved in protecting the integrities of children, these, such a person or condition has to take into account the need to protect and preserve the child from artificial uh, involvements in irrational or inconceivable circumstances. For instance, the child coming in now, it becomes the duty of the parent to introduce him to a political structure that is in tragic difficulties an economic system that has never actually worked into a political and uh, industrial system which really didn't exist uh, much more than one or two hundred years ago. He also has to face a religious problem which he may know something about in his subconscious. Therefore, some children seem to be born with a natural tendency to religion and others are not. But all of these problems come to the parent when the little one arrives and it must be made to fit into the circumstances that it is going to face. By doing this consistently and relentlessly, the parent trying to help the child to be happy, comfortable and successful, binds it to a pattern which is entirely materialistic and physical in its emphasis. The child is taught how to live in a world where it is only going to remain for 70, 80, or 90 years, and then will return to an eternity to which it has belonged forever and will forever belong. The importance of this embodiment, therefore, while it is real, while it is significant, while it is a measure of testing and learning, is not the tremendous reason for embodiment. The individual does not come in this world primarily to add to the labor force. It is not here to determine that it can earn a living, that it may be one of a few who accumulate fortunes, it may have a professional standing, it may be famous or distinguished in life, but in the course of time it simply disappears again into the invisible realms from which it came. Now, in our materialistic civilization, this little span of 70 or 80 years is all important. Nothing else really counts. 
Even our religion now is largely focused upon the effort to help us to be morally comfortable in an immoral atmosphere. It also tries to give us hope and aspirations, but builds us very little substance upon which to build or base such hope. So we are left now as a being in eternity, an everlasting creature, caught within the pattern of a physical embodiment and uh, largely over-influenced and over-conditioned as to the significance of this physical existence. Now the mystics of all time have pointed out that someone, some way, must lay a foundation to help children and young people, and for that matter so many of the older people, into a relationship with life that is significant, that has meaning, that does not allow us to be born, grow up, pass through a series of economic upheavals, retire on a pension, and die. This does not seem to justify any significant social or universal pattern. There's something wrong with the concept. And because of this wrong concept, we've had 50,000 years of history and prehistory that has been nothing but a vast cycle of dolefulness, of regrets, of sorrows, of violence, of constant uh, unrest. And the individual forever sacrificed to the prevailing policy of his contemporary culture. This does not seem to work any significant good. It does not accomplish anything to justify the labor and problem of coming into this world, growing up, passing through all the phases of life, and then having nothing to look forward to the end, at the end, but a quiet passing to where. No one seems to even be quite sure the answer to that question. So children coming into this world come into a situation that is very frustrating from the beginning. They come into families where the parents are as unhappy as they are going to be. They come into an environment in which very little is secure. They are sent to school to learn how to make a living or a profession but they can graduate cum laude and at the same time make a bad marriage six weeks later. There doesn't seem to me any sense in it all. And the child gradually loses its most valuable value and part, and that is its childlikeness. Now, there are two different words we use in these terms. One is childishness, which is truly physical infancy or the senility of the aged. The other is childlikeness, and it is the childlikeness that greatly interested Mencius, the Chinese philosopher. In some mysterious way, from the cradle to the grave, we are and always will be children. The idea that we have grown up is not supported by actual evidence. <laughs> the, uh, the world in which we live cannot prove that even many of our most brilliant leaders are really mature. Maturity implies values. And no matter how successful the person is, if he is without values, he is not mature. So the average child growing up through the environment of his physical embodiment does not contribute much to his own maturity. He gradually loses track of himself. He forgets himself. And I become simply a first personal pronoun by which he intends to identify himself. He says, I want, but in substance he doesn't know what he wants. He says, I believe, but that belief is not strong enough to do him much practical good. I hope, that sounds rather helpful, but it's quickly undermined by adversity. I fear this is much more common and is much more likely to be uh, maintained over a period of time. Therefore, we keep saying, I do this, I believe that, I want this, I don't want that. And yet, they don't know what the I is that is asking the question, and we really don't know what it wants if it does reach out for something. And for the most part, if it reaches out for its own highest values, uh, we are failures physically. We are unable to adjust to the commercialism of a contemporary culture. 
And many religions have developed mystical groups or organizations or societies or retreats for those who do not wish to become hopelessly entangled in the power struggle of our present generation. These uh, people are quiet, mystical, hopeful, uh, given to religious speculation, desirous of doing good works, charitable, and forgiving in nature. And to live this way, that seems to be the easiest method, is to retire from this terrific pressure of civilization. Unfortunately, again, the retirement doesn't work too well because retirement causes the person to lose the experience wisdom which comes from struggling through it to the best of one's ability. So the retiring person usually uh, disappears into a mystical uh, haze from which he may never return. It still it does not solve the main problem. Now if we have a small child and a rather lovable little creature at that, we begin to note that it has some kind of a nature or disposition of its own. Actually, it's very possible that that nat natural disposition may be more real than anything it's going to learn from outside contributions. The little child generally is strong in faith, has great affections for those that care for it, tries to be attractive in temperament, and uh, gradually evolves into a more or less delightful a member of the household. All this up to about the period of three years. <laughs> After this, complications begin. Why? Because this little child is brought under the very strong pressure of family tradition. It is expected to follow the religion of its parents. And if its parents are orthodox, it is indoctrinated by the time it is four or five years old. It is supposed to like what the parents like, dislike what the parents dislike, and to always follow the wisdom of the parental guidance. And this parental guidance may be rather deficient in wisdom, and is in most cases. So the child gradually takes on conditions, as they used to say back in the 1920s, when popular psychology followed the take on condition school, which was quite popular. Uh, actually, the child finds gradually that the only way it can really get along nicely, as nicely as possible, is to do what other people want it to do, and to conform with whatever policy dominates the family into which it is born. This conditioning goes on, and as uh, Comenius pointed out, the father of the modern public school system, we have now lost track of the fact that education usually begins when the child is born and by the child goes to, goes to school the first time, the education is complete. In other words, it is educated before it ever goes to school. Now, by education, we do not mean it is enlightened, but it is under a pressure of conditioning which is setting its character, establishing its beliefs, and hopefully increasing its morality and ethics. To therefore ov eliminate, overlook, or forget the tremendous importance of early conditioning on the child is to contribute to the collapse of civilization. Mencius knew, knew this, and so did Confucius. The neglected child is the greatest hazard that a nation can have. It is the greatest cause of the gradual corruption and disintegration of the social structure. This social structure, Confucius pointed out, consists at the beginning of certain recognitions and values. The family is a unit. The family is the basic unit of human society. It is the rock foundation upon which all cultures are built. It is the original government. It is the original system of education. It is also the basis of economic security, and by the contributions that it makes in various ways, it sets the example to lead the next generation into a little larger fulfillment of its purposes. Now, in the childhood home, there are certain restraints upon individual freedoms. 
in order to protect a child's character there must be attention given to it it must be brought into the realization of what is constitutes a proper family situation now this cannot be done by indoctrination you can tell the child what it ought to do forever but the child is keenly aware of actions of the relationships of these adults to each other nothing that they can say to kind of paraphrase Emerson talks as loud as what they see their families do so the child begins at an early age uh, to require conditioning the Chinese said for example that in the family there must be a kind of regimentation there must be an order of procedure there must be things that must always occur all members of the family living in together or scattered and occasionally coming together must always under all conditions treat each other with gentility civil civility courtesy and understanding it is a serious breach of family ed education for parents to nag at each other shout at each other or hate each other this is not just detrimental to the family it will ultimately bring down the nation we don't realize that the for lack of the horse nail shoe nail the war that uh, was lost but it is in the social circumstances of mankind actually the parents must know must never have a relationship among themselves that is not dominated by gentility courtesy and affection otherwise this is going to be passed on to the child and the child is going to begin to recognize that it should or could gain certain advantages by being unpleasant and this is one of the earliest examples children follow and the next thing that is uh, important is that in family life in the intimate relationships of life there must always be uh, gentility thoughtfulness mutual respect each member of the family must basically respect the other members not tolerate them not get along with them the best they can but respect them and their rights and their privileges and their relationships so that in the home if it's to be a successful place for the rearing of children the home must have a harmonious genteel constructive idealistic atmosphere not read out of books not necessarily by attending professional places of worship or education but by natural recognition that the basic relationship of all humanity is fraternity that it, we must all live together graciously or dangers rise on every hand so the child is taught this by or in the concept of Chinese guidance the second thing the child is taught is that any action which it commits which is wrong which discredits it which in any way is inconsistent with the family integrities is a disgrace and the disgrace falls not only upon the child but upon his ancestors and his descendants the wayward child is a disgrace to ten generations of Chinese elders it must therefore be that every move that is committed by a genteel person of good breeding must be acceptable not only for himself but for the family to which he belongs and must be making a positive contribution to the future this type of thing is very hard for us to understand we would regard this as more or less a penalization system in which the individual is not permitted to do what he pleases well in nature if the truth were out no one in this world is ever permitted to do what he pleases he can only do what he pleases and what he pleases is right and the moment it isn't right infirmities begin to afflict him and the right to be wrong does not exist in nature nor does it convey any of the values which are important to life so we have to figure that the child must learn always to speak respectfully to its elders respectfully to its 
fellow children, brothers and sisters, respectful to the stranger who comes, to the friend who visits, and must bow with all the rest of the family before the ancestral tablets in the family shrine. These things are security. They are security when this child goes out in life, because it will be strengthened against corruption, against danger of wrong association, dissipation, extravagance, and all these things. This all belongs to an education that precedes schooling. And this is where, to a large degree, the world has drifted into trouble. The mature elders, the parental generation, is becoming ever more concerned with its own rights, with its own privileges, with its own willingness to do the things that are most pleasing to itself. The individual, the adult, now feels, very largely, that he has the right to live as he pleases, that he is entitled to all the liberties that he can possibly hold on to, that he is entitled to the highest standard of living to which he can attain. And if this results in an economic situation in which he must shortchange his own family, must fail to do those things which bring proper maturity to his children, then he is sacrificing the future for his own pleasure. This is the problem that Confucius faced when he went to the Duke of Lu and tried to influence the Duke to make him a prime minister of this province of China. The uh, Duke ex more or less explained to him the facts of life namely that he, uh, he as the duke was going to do exactly as he pleased that he was going to favor those who favored him advance those who advanced him and give greatest attention to those who brought the largest revenues this was su such that Confucius then retired from public life and into his little school where he continued to teach until the time of his death Plato had the same experience he had intended to run as a, for Archon of Athens, one of the senators of the city. But after serving a very short time in Athenian politics, he retired permanently and also re went into his little academy to create a private universe nearer to the will of God. So these things happen. And we begin to study the problem. Now the child's getting along. By this time, it has a number of bad habits. Habits which really didn't belong with itself. He didn't bring them with him when he came here. He got them when he was too young to resist them. He nags, he howls, he screams. If he doesn't get what he wants, he puts on a temper fit. And an harassed and embarrassed family will do almost anything he, uh, he wants them to. The child's well-being is secondary to the comfort of the family that doesn't wish to be faced with problems. All this goes along and finally the child reaches school, school age. By this time the child's understanding of the world into which he has recently been introduced is apt to be rather faulty. He is already becoming convinced that there is nothing much he's ever going to be able to do to make anything any better and that the most important thing he can do is to adjust himself to the corruptions of his contemporaries. He must follow some peer group of some kind. If he wants higher education, he can take his leadership from one of the more important universities. Here he will come under the peership of professors who will teach him exactly what they want him to know, and uh, mostly they will teach him to disregard those subtle principles of inner life which are the basis of his true humanity. It is very difficult outside of a theological seminary to find a university that really fundamentally emphasizes the importance of soul power over mind or body force. The individual is being taught to make a living. In the process of making a living, he may be on the football team, he may become a basketball player, he may break a few ribs or something of that kind in the cause of good, clean fun. And uh, gradually, he is reduced into a pawn in a great world of people. 
By the time he has graduated from his peer group and is settled in life, his horizon is so close that he can scarcely look beyond his own face. There is very little left for him. He must settle back into the routine problem that he has come to accept as inevitable. By uh, normal circumstances, he may also take on a few responsibilities himself, and if he has a responsibility for a family, he will still, still further limit his own personal insights and his own integrities in order to provide for them. So it goes on, and generation after generation comes along from Alexander the Great to Adolf Hitler, and the same things go on. War, crime, all these things, and they all begin every generation with a chubby little baby just coming into the world with a big grin, which gradually changes into a whale if he doesn't receive proper attention. So this is the way it all starts. These little children are the future dictators, the future politicians, the future uh, executives of all kinds, and the, and the future policy makers. They finally become the ones who vote for someone else. And their voting is judged largely by the inducements of their environment. So the child moves from an internal life, which it brings with it, to an environmental pattern, which it must gradually assume as it would take on a suit of clothes. Therefore, the outer life of the individual is regarded as a garment. It is something he has to wear, and that must be cut according to the style of the time and place where he lives. And this garment has gradually come to be mistaken for himself. He is supposed to be what he wears. He is supposed to be exactly what he says after he has been conditioned to the degree that he no longer speaks for himself. All this type of thing is against the better good of each of us. Now, how long can we say that this childhood lasts? Well, it's hard to say. But I think the easiest way to summarize it is that childhood of the kind that we are concerned with extends from the cradle to the grave. The individual always has the child heart. It always belongs in some way to childishness. And many of its so-called mature actions are infantile. It makes more stupid mistakes than you can possibly classify. It seems to lack common sense, judgment, and all of these things, but it has been trained out of the big smile that it had when it was a small child. All of these mysteries which the child faces with wonder, we face with anxiety and morbidity. Actually, therefore, all the way along, the problem of restoring, protecting, or recreating child-likeness is very, very important. And uh, what is childlikeness? What are the virtues of a child which has been given some attention and is allowed to develop some of its natural functions? If it has not been hurt, damaged, or interfered with by circumstances of early life, the natural instinct of the child is to be lovable. Its natural instinct also is to realize that it is living in a very large world. From the time when the little tyke reaches up to try to get hold of the doorknob, it begins to know that it lives in a world of beings and creatures larger than itself, and in the midst of which he or it is a Lilliputian. It is a mere tininess, surrounded by things that are much bigger and stronger and more powerful. These things that are so big and powerful gradually come to play the past of God. They become the divine powers that are inevitable and infallible. And while this condition goes on, the child generally has some reasonable protection, unless the parents tear it down themselves. But as it goes further into life and begins to try to live out its uh, destiny, there's something else comes in that uh, usually has to mature a little bit before it has a chance to express itself, and that is experience. We gradually come to experience the fact that most of the things that we believe are doubtful, and some are complete falsehoods. We also learn to believe by gradual means that some way, somehow, there is something that is a better guide to life than we are accustomed to accept. 
we begin to realize that scholasticism has very serious limitations and that nearly all great thinkers have themselves revolted against it. We also began to think of what we call common sense. Common sense is something that seems to be an inward rationalism. It is an inward honesty. If common sense can be particularly impressed as a term, it would be that it is honesty. It is the effort to achieve the reality of things. And if we turn common sense upon the world as we know it, we're going to get quite a shock. So the best thing that we can do for most people is not to permit that to occur. They are not going to allow truth, common judgment, reality, experience, and the ideals that have descended to us from the past to become too much involved in daily actions. If, they, if we do or they do, we're going to be hurt too badly. Common sense is one of the things the child brings with it. Why? Because it has already had long experience in it. The child that comes into the world is naturally burdened with unfinished business. It comes not as a brand new thing. It comes as a burdened creature. A creature burdened by its own unfinished and unregenerated past. A burden of things yet to be achieved and accomplishment. A debt to be paid. An opportunity to be created. A step forward in integrities and values. These things are part of the heritage that comes with the child into its own embodiment. As a result of that, the child gradually either releases something of itself in the form of its needs, or it is blocked in this procedure, and what it really needs is locked within itself, and it takes on the heavy burdens of worldliness as it is around us. The problem, therefore, of common sense is that somewhere lurking in the inner part of each one of us is a con considerable honesty. There is a wonderful, strange value inside of us. Worldliness cannot kill it, but it can lock it where it is no longer easily available. Each person has the possibility of being led by the sole power within itself. And that sole power is born of experience. It is born of having learned the very severe and real facts of life over a long period of time, over many embodiments, until certain values become increasingly clear. And when we leave any embodiment, we take this added clarification with us in the future. So the child does have these basic values which we might generally call common sense. Some people might call them intuition. Others may consider them a mystical attribute. But in reality, they are simply the truth of existence, moving in gradually upon the life of the individual. We never will get it all at once. This, the truth of the existence of which we are a part is accumulated over hundreds of embodiments. But it grows a little each time so that we come just a shade nearer the truth. And the truth that we have to learn are many different types and styles and kinds, but they all are important to the growth of the person. One of the first things that we have to learn is to recognize the importance of inner guidance. This guidance that we have brought with us into life and which we have blocked consistently for years. Now, if we continue to block this inner guidance indefinitely, we will result, we will begin to action a series of mistakes. If we don't listen to it, or if we resist it, or we are unable to recognize this integrity if someone else communicates it to us, when this goes on long enough, we are in trouble. We begin to have suffering. Misery closes in. Misery is caused primarily by departure from the plan to which we belong. Misery is the individual who is not doing it the way it should be done. Misery is therefore something that most people want to get over. But there's no pill to take that pain away. There is only change of character and integrities. Now even the small child, or at least the growing child, 
in early friendships with teachers and playmates and all these uh, local uh, uh, associations, does learn some little things. He begins to see what another child who is too selfish is doing, or some bully in the junior grade is not keeping the peace, keeping the integrities that are right. And each of us instinctively notices what is wrong, or thinks we can notice it. But when it happens, we just simply walk away from it, because we don't know what to do with it, or what is right instead. We just keep on struggling with it. So we have to begin to think in terms of unfolding the potential within our own nature in some basic way. Now, some children have brought with them a different karmic pattern from others. The karmic patterns are more difficult where the previous conduct of the individual himself has been difficult or unfruitful. Many persons have lived many lives very selfishly, self-centeredly, violently. They've had false values on all levels, so that when they are reborn, they are going to be inevitably associated in some way with conditions which in the past they have imposed upon others. The individual who has bullied others over a long period of time must finally be brought in line by being the victim of being bullied by someone else. It is only in this way, apparently, that many people are able over a long period of life to correct the evils that they have allowed to develop within themselves. So when we start out with the problems, we try to figure out how to straighten out the life we live. And I know some little children that worked out some pretty good ideas on this. I knew a little girl who was came from a fairly comfortable family and the family provided her with a sandbox. I suppose very few people now know what a sandbox is. A sandbox is a little box-like thing, maybe four or five feet long, and the same width, with about six inches of dry sand in it. Now this is the basis of a, a whole world, because you can wet the sand down a little and begin to make it into all kinds of things. And in a little time, they'll pull the castle in, out of the, in the sandbox. And another day you will build a garden. You can build houses and towers and monuments, or you can build all kinds of interesting shapes just in the sand, like mountains and valleys and all this type of thing. So one day while I was watching this, I saw that the girl had made a, a very nice house with a little roof and chimney and everything, all of wet sand. So I said, uh, too bad that isn't going to last very long. And she looked up, she was about five years old, she says, it doesn't make any difference. Nothing we build here will last very long. She was about to full 20 or 30 incarnations ahead of her parents. This was the, this was the way I was. She was w waking up to something, which other people have a long time getting around to. But it's not a bad idea for the child heart, the, regardless of physical age, to realize that in a way life is very much like a sandbox. Here in this little mass of sand, we build everything you can think of. We build empires, we put little tin soldiers and have battles, we put little animals and have pastures and farms, and in the sandbox we build all kinds of archetypal patterns. And I think it's too bad that children don't have more sandboxes, because I think it would do them more good than psychoanalysis in many cases. <laughs> because it would show what they're thinking about, what they're feeling, and how they're trying to express it. But life, to all of us, whether we know it or not, is not very different from a sandbox. It can be very elaborate, but at the present time the sandbox is there, but because of the smog we can hardly see the box, <laughs> let alone do anything important with it. But the sandbox is very important because it is the miniature of the universe. We are all playing in sandboxes. And we are all also largely playing in the same sandbox, which is a little larger. And as each person comes along, the first thing he does is tear down the previous work in the sandbox and put his own in its place. This is commonly known as progress. <laughs> but it is just simply that the individual is daydreaming. He is imagining the things that he thinks would help. But in the long analysis, the small child is the one who realizes that it's all in a sandbox. It has not yet been 
uh, overwhelmed, over-influenced to the degree that it assumes that the things that are built in the sandbox are frightfully important and are going to change the course of history. The only way they will change the course of history is when someone else comes along to play in the same sandbox and tears down the original design. This is history. And this is the type of world we've lived in because somewhere along the line we just forgot that we are doing these things. We have grown up to the point where we really take ourselves seriously. Each generation takes itself seriously. Each individual becomes deeply concerned, not with his integrities, but with the passing shadows which he casts upon society. We are all in the same fix. But the child that Manchus mentions is the child with the child heart of regardless of age. A child heart that in all things simply sees reality. Just simply sees the thing as it is. Because it has not yet developed the, uh, we will, might say, the prejudices and conceits and deceits by means of which the child heart is destroyed. Now, with the child heart, the world comes into the mystical, but also the idealistic, uh, range of possibilities. We can say, therefore, that uh, if we have lost it due to troubles, or sometimes just simply due to success, which is a very destructive thing in many cases, we have to get it again. Now, mysticism, as it practiced both in the West and in the East, is very late, lightly and largely an effort to restore the child heart. Before we can find out what's inside of ourselves, we have to escape from the dynamic pressure of our own mental attitudes. We have to get over the idea that the things that are making us unhappy every day are inevitable, that they are part of a universal plan we can do nothing about. We have to realize that we are responsible for our animosities, for our antagonisms, and our exploitations. And until these cease, there was going to be nothing but misery. So with the search for the child heart, most people, somewhere along the line, remember the fact that once they were five years old, and at that time, the world looked pretty good. For most people, the world looked like infinite opportunity. And now, 40, 50 years later, the world looks like infinite discomfort that everything is not the way it should be, that we are constantly struggling after false goals, and that out of all of this tremendous struggle we have made to build mountains in our sandboxes, we are broken-hearted, disillusioned, and enfeebled by the lack of internal courage and resource. So, maybe at 40, 50 years of old, of old we must go back after that child heart. We must become children again if, if we are to be part of the kingdom of heaven. We have to be what might be termed an archetypal child, the kind of child that has all that is good in childish mannerism, that has all of the beauties and the integrities and the attractiveness of the small child. We have to realize that even though we are living in a sophisticated world, our own, our own way of life is still very childish. That we are actually crawling around trying to find out how to walk, let alone how to do all the wonderful things we think we can do. Actually then, get, getting rid of sophistication is no more or less than getting rid of what we have called maturity. Now everybody thinks maturity is a, is a wonderful thing. Well, maturity has a lot of advantages, including 10% off on certain products that you buy. <laughs> but maturity is not that. Maturity is the individual ability to outgrow his own mistakes. Maturity is the person who has awakened to the reality. He is the person who has discovered the real dimensions of the sandbox. He is the one who has realized 
that if there is no reason for existence other than that which he has experienced in his own daily living, then the whole plan is rather impoverished. But that he may have had a wonderful experiences and failed to benefit from them is only a proof that sophistication has destroyed his own integrity. So coming to the realization he's got to get back probably not only through the childhood of this life but maybe the childhood of a hundred lives to find out what the realities are. He must begin to dig inside himself for somewhere in the depths of his own nature is the record of all he has been, all he has done, all he has hoped for. Now it may not be available to him in form of incidents, which is just as well. Very few people could sustain a detailed biography of their own previous embodiments. It would indicate too much misery and sorrow due to personal mistakes. But there comes forward a kind of balance sheet in which the person has certain general attitudes about the things he has gone through. He has realized that certain processes of the past gave him great pain. On the other hand, certain nice experiences or beautiful occasions, comes, they come down to him as credits and assets and something to enrich faith and hope and charity. So we start out to get back to the child center within ourselves. And that child center is simply the incarnating self in us, the thing that lives from generation to generation, from age to age. And there is the oversoul of Emerson, that mysterious power by which we can be inwardly guided and taught rather than depending upon a scholastic system which has no interest in the eternal life of the individual, only in his buying and selling power over a few years. So to get back into this again, we have to do what the child has to do, and which most children should be taught to do, but they are not, and that is to spend some time quietly with themselves. Every child should have periods of peace which are important to it. It should be able to retire for a little while and simply remember in a mysterious, general way the eternity to which it belongs. This is very important to small children, but today it is gradually being crowded out and every available moment is spent in front of a television. All this is not good, and the older person who is beginning to realize that it isn't good must begin to dig inside of himself to get back the simplicity of the divine. Uh, Jesus in his preachings seldom used words of over one syllable, sometimes two syllables. Nearly all of the great teachers have taught very simply. They have taught realities. They have taught compassion, friendship, kindness. They have taught those graces which go from life to a life not graces which are no longer any good when we leave here. When we devote everything we have to adjustment here and forget entirely to adjust with the infinite which we always belong to and always will belong to, life does not go well. So mysticism steps in to help us to regain the child core within ourselves. And it begins by finding the same appreciations that children believe the bed of flowers, the forest, the trees, a little pet, all of these things help to restore in us a sympathy for life, a recognition of the sublimity of something around us, and how something within us is crying out to protect those beauties around us. And that's why we feel a little sad when another forest is cut down to make way for condominiums. Something is lost. Something is taken away. We say it is necessary. Well, if we have to lose the land on the outside for the condominium, it is more important still that we plow the inner life and keep the garden there growing in good health. We have to build into the internal and the invisible most of the projects which are going to endure. We have to build more and more upon things unseen, 
rather than storing up our treasures at 11%. We need a great deal more insight. We have to have material things. No one denies it. But we also have to have time and place for those things which belong to God, those things which belong to the Spirit within us. And as we get nearer and nearer to the realization of the divine, we seem to grow younger. And very soon, as we approach the divine, we are small children again. We are children in the face of God, just as we are adults in the face of each other. The divine in us is forever seeking the parental principle of life, the principle which loves all things, serves all things, sacrifices for all things, and in intends beyond all doubt to bring life together into the final fulfillment of the divine hope. These things we have to work with, so we'd set aside a little time for eternity in this world of confusion and stress. And uh, we don't do that by thinking about nothing. We do it rather by trying to understand the common sense and the things that happen to us. Learn to understand values and the lesson we should learn rather than the incident that we would regret. Many people would like to forget the most valuable experiences of their lives. That is not the answer. Nature will not let us forget those valued experiences, and if we don't pay attention to them here, they'll catch up to us later. The moment a valuable experience occurs, no matter how uncomfortable it may be, it is absolutely necessary to examine it, to consider it, and to transmute it from a misfortune to a spiritual asset. We have to correct our own mistakes by facing them. And if we face our mistakes and correct them, then they cease to exist. In, in quietude of mysticism, the individual, therefore, lives to simplify, even as in his outer li life he lives to complicate. Everything that is real is essentially simple. And that is why the child heart can take it, and why it comes from the child heart because the child can be best approached in simple words and simple thoughts. And it is the same with the mature of age, the older child, the child in their 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s. They can also be best understood and can understand best in simple thoughts and simple terms. Each person can simplify the complications of his own life until he finally realizes that he lived all these years with truth locked within himself, which he was not able to use because he had put a barrier of intellectualism between himself and truth. The child hasn't done this. The child is open. After troubles come along, we begin to shut up. We close off experience. We build walls against it. We fight to protect the status quo. We, are, we do not want to change. We fear growth or progress. And therefore we lock ourselves in our misfortune. The small child living in wonder can explore and understand things that are beyond our comprehension. But the small child in us can awaken again and understand them. So we watch little by little to see what happens. And we observe that in this day there are a great many intellectual activities. There are all kinds of people doing all kinds of things, many of them interesting and useful. But there is also a vast conflict of individuals who, while all interested in the common good, are unable to even be reasonably pleasant in the presence of each other. All the way along, attitudes become the basis of barriers. Our thoughts become the barriers of somebody else's thoughts. Here we go back to the sandbox. We have built something in that box that to us is just wonderful. So when our back is turned, or when the time comes for us to leave sandboxes, someone else comes along behind us, tears down what we have done, and proceeds to build something else. Or if we're not lucky, they may try to do it while we're still building ours. Uh, but in any event comes a great conflict, a conflict of uh, objectives, 
a, a conflict of projects that we have. As we get deeper and deeper into life, these conflicts fade away. Well, the mystics and many of the great idealistic teachers of humanity have realized that the nearer we come to reality, all of us, the more similar our beliefs become. And that when we attain reality, we will all have the same belief, not imposed upon us, but discovered by us in the process of our own growth. So uh, the child heart isn't much interested in sectarianism or in p political structures. It is seeking forever faith, truth, love, understanding. It wants to laugh and not just to cry. It wants to be close to something, not separated from it by all kinds of artificial barriers. It wants that little kitten or the little puppy dog that it can pour out its soul to. These are the things of the child heart. And as we grow older, these unfold into the great virtues of life. These are the things that gradually become tremendous, so important that when the time finally comes, we can go to sleep in these things and wake in another life. Everything should be a gentle experience of values. Now, this may seem almost impossible in a world such as we live in. Fortunately, all of these are internal projects, and internal projects do not have any serious reper repercussions upon our daily life. We do not need to make enemies in order to grow. We do not need to defy other people in order to put our ideas across, because these things are not important anyway. All of this is nothing but the castle in the sandbox. What we really should do and must do if we're going to rescue ourselves is simply to know the art of being kind, to know the gentleness by which we can live with other people, allow them to live their lives as best they can, try to understand them, and whenever the need arises, be courteous and affectionate with them. Actually, to recognize in a mysterious way that we are all in the same dilemma, that some people feel that they have solved the dilemma and others do not, and very few agree as to what the solution is. But one thing we all agree on, and that we have a dilemma. We have an unsettled and uncertain future, a difficult present time to face life. Therefore, we have a common cause. And for this common cause, we must give greater emphasis and may have less pressure upon the different separate solutions which we attempt to apply. If we become very quiet inside ourselves, the answer will come. And the answer always comes from the inside. And the answer comes because in the quietude of ourselves, we break through the artificial accumulations of the mind and get back to that root which is dark and mysterious within us. All of our great problems, are, practically all of them, are mind-oriented. <coughs> With the mind, we build all our philosophies, all our political systems, all our economic and scientific achievements. We also build the social mores of our time. It is the mind that tells us how we should live, the mind telling us who we should like and who we should dislike, the mind forever dominating the things that we do, but the mind itself essentially unreliable. The mind is too much objectified by prejudice. In the mind, the intolerance of a lifetime are stored carefully. Unfortunate memories are kept on file. And everything that has conditioned us adversely is gradually changing our behavior and making us victory, uh, victims of our own mistakes. The mind is the slayer of the real. Therefore, in trying to solve our world problems, there is no use of piling one mental attitude on another. The solution is not in the world, but in the hearts of men. The solution is not in the grand uh, reformations and revolutions that have led only to further bloodshed since the beginning of time. The answer lies in the gradual release of soul power, 
the power of the inner life over conduct. Uh, we have to have the what Gandhi called the victory of soul power over brute power. We also have to have the victory of soul understanding and insight over the complex of varying intellectual policies and beliefs. So if we can get quiet, we can unload part of the burden that never was any good anyway. Get rid of memories that only haunt us. Now you can't forget them by saying you should. The only way you can forget them is to outgrow them to solve them, to take that unpleasant bitterness that you had 25 years ago and which you have never been able to solve, sit down quietly with it and get over it. Get over it by proving beyond all question of doubt that it was a, an opportunity to grow, that there was something about it that you had to learn, and that it, the purpose of the experience was that you should transmute an incident into soul growth. And if you have done that, you have no longer any problem, and you can easily even be thankful for the person who has offended you, if it has helped you to grow. But if it does not help you to grow, it will embitter and canker you from that time on. And the mind will not get over this alone. We can sweep the mind's house out periodically, we can refurbish it, we can move it onto a better ground and all this type, but this is not the answer. It is the power of that which is above the mind and by, to which the mind must give allegiance if that power is active. But if that power in ourselves is not active, if we do nothing about it, then the mind becomes the dictator and as an audacious prime minister takes over control. Then we have trouble. And mostly people have allowed this to happen. The mind has become the basis of a character, of a policy, or of a way of life, or of a religion, or anything you wish to call it. But in the last analysis, the mind is a tyrant. It helps us to remain just as foolish as we were, or else helps us sometimes to multiply foolishness, to get worse than we were before. And in interpreting things, the mind always interprets in favor of our own attitude and opinion and gladly sacrifices the rights of others to even think in order to protect our right to make our own mistakes so that the mind is not reliable. But beyond and behind the mind is something that we may say is a life in itself. And in the New Testament we are told of the golden wedding garment which the bridegroom Bears when they come to the bride to be when they, to the wedding of the Lamb, in the Book of Revelation and uh, some other parts of the Bible, we hear about the wedding, and this wedding is the church, according to Christian tradition, united in wedding in marriage to the Lamb of God. Actually, this mysterious hermetic wedding, perhaps the wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz is the union of the personal as the bride of the eternal. All we are as persons, as individuals, as separate beings, we bring to the altar of the eternal. The soul is actually the power to control and direct and enlighten and redeem life. So the golden wedding garment is the soul garment woven from the beauties and integrities of character which we possess. This garment is woven of love, and every time we are able to change indifference to love, there is a new st strand in this seamless robe. Every time we forgive an enemy, there is another bit of uh, material added. Little by little, this garment gradually transforms our life. We become robed in the values of righteousness. We behold more clearly the beautiful values of life which we have sacrificed to selfishness. Now we may say, this might cause trouble to do all these things. How are we going to make a living? It doesn't do one thing to prevent anyone from making a living. The mysteries of the spirit are internal and eternal. And the only thing that we have to do on the outer world is be just a little more honorable in our conduct. 
and little by little the things that we believe will become more important. We are here only a little while, and the only thing we can take with us is this marvelous and wondrous soul experience which we have accumulated through the years of insight and understanding. Therefore, if you can begin to shake off or get rid of the ballast of, of negative thinking, destructive attitudes, and uh, corrupt allegiances, you will find gradually that the simple things of life will come through. Kindness will take hold. In the Buddhist doctrine, uh, the next Buddha, according to them, is the Lord Maitreya, who is waiting in the Tushte heaven to come to earth after a certain period of time. And the, uh, you know, all these Buddhas are metaphysical Buddhas, so-called. They are not persons. They never were. They are embodiments or personifications of qualities. And therefore it is appropriate that the next great Buddha to come should be the Lord Maitreya. For in Sanskrit the word Maitreya means kindness. Therefore it is the coming of the great kindness that restores the child soul. In this great kindness everyone becomes a child, has no longer the sophisticated attitudes of a false maturity, but in gentleness and kindliness restores the golden age. And there is nothing that we can do that is more valuable than to prove that we are taking care of this garden of the world where we have been placed. Up to now we have been ravishing this garden for centuries, thinking of nothing but our own enrichment and forgetting the fact we can take nothing with us. Of all the tyrants that have ever lived, all have died and taken nothing with them. And therefore, there seems to be no good reason why we should constantly struggle for that which we cannot keep. Could they be dishonest, dishonorable, destructive, simply for powers that fade in a very few years? That out of this little embodiment which we know and is our little life in a sandbox, there is really no reason for the terrible destructiveness that we work upon each other. There is no reason for wars and revolutions or these tremendous problems of nitrogen bombs and everything you can think of. These things are simply delusions. They are false values. They never have any real existence. But we do not want to continue to look forward to the fact that we have to die out of this world to find peace. What we should be able to do is live here and make peace real. Find ways in which we can do these things. Now, someone will say it can't be done. Well, maybe it can, maybe it can't. But one thing can be done. In, in ourselves, we can first establish that peace. We can establish it by returning to the simple acceptances of life which mark the small child. We can be born again, not in the theological sense, but in the sense of a new birth in childlike simplicity. Somewhere along the way, we can have another birth as a child. Again, this birth as a child is a case in which we cast off, uh, not necessarily the body, but cast off the attitudes which have made it impossible for us to grow. A attitudes which have given us nothing but sorrow selfishness, self-centered, antagonisms of every kind, attitudes in which we have sacrificed peace and happiness, and as a result have been punished not only by our misery and misfortune, but by sickness and all times of disasters. Why not have the sense of a five-year-old and consciously decide to get rid of these things? To find that the, anything that hurts needlessly any other creature should be forever out of our systems that we are not here to blame people we are here to work with them for common growth we are not here to compete with them we are here for the great problem of learning to cooperate together for the survival of man and the glory of God we are here to live out a plan not a chaos we are here to do things that will make a better world 
We are not here simply to go on until we pass out of this life. Pass out of the life without any knowledge of why we were born, without any realization of what we should have done, but occasionally there are what William Blake called the good people, who have always by nature lived well, regardless of circumstances. And these people are truly the ones in which in his engravings Blake shows the soul of the good person ascending in the keeping of the angels. There is uh, this idea that this good we do cuts away from us most of the troubles and sorrows of life. If we were not opinionated, self-centered, and dogmatic, our lives would be much simpler. And children aren't those things normally because they haven't been educated into them. And the pressures of society working on the mind, and the mind only, have gradually changed many millions of people into, ma into small tyrants who found, found no pleasure or happiness for themselves and give none to others. This type of thing is, try is the result of assuming that we grow up and by growing up we become heartless. By growing up we become disillusioned, cruel, self-centered, arrogant, and live only for a few dollars uh, that will vanish as they always have. The, the whole point is that we try to use the mind to get the impression that we're growing up. But we're not. We don't grow up because we become more complicated. We grow up because we become less complicated. It's true in politics. Someday in this world, this whole political system has to finally dissolve into the fact that we have one planet with very limited resources and we better learn to get along together happily. It would be so much easier, save a great deal of wear and tear, and liberate the mind for more constructive thinking. There's no reason why it couldn't happen. And there's no reason why these things can't happen in ourselves. I think Confucius would say they must happen in ourselves first. The first thing we've got to take care of is the rectification of personal character. Then we've got to prove this rectification, this self-improvement, by carrying it into our intimate domestic life. We've got to make this new level of integrities the basis of the home, of our cour courteous and proper relationships with those to whom we are tied by blood or by bonds. Therefore, that the proof of our redemption, the proof that our childhood is back, as it is that we live quietly, constructively, and become beloved of those who know us, always willing to help, always patient in problems, always unselfish in moments of decision, and always liberal and tolerant of the beliefs of other people. If we can establish homes upon this basis, if more and more people under the pressure of present circumstances are realizing that we are dis disintegrating the foundations of society for no good reason, then we may be able gradually uh, to restore the simple life. Nature sometimes almost does this for us. Many Pierce persons, as they grow older, become again a little bit like children. They become more kind, more detached, more gentle, or if they've had a bad conditioning all the way along, they can become impossible. But if they are impossible, they are impossible children. They have brought back all the childish defects, all of the immaturities of life, and they remain in their closing years perfect examples of what to avoid. And the time has come to avoid this type of thing, so that we live in peace and die in peace, that we are born gently and lovingly, that we carry out our daily duties and responsibilities faithfully, that we earn our lives livelihood by diligence, that we depend only upon our own inner resources for the decisions that give us the courage and the values to live as better people. If we work out these problems a little bit in our own gentle way, we can find a new childhood of humanity. It would be kind of wonderful to find a whole world of nothing but happy children. 
Well, that world of happy children is here. Because each one of us is a happy child who has become miserable by trying to grow up. When actually all we have done is to grow old. You have not grown up because to grow up means that this child life has got to come through and become one of the great creative and protective forces of our human existence. Then there won't be any more of this constant irritation. We can do it to ourselves, and that's the beginning. This is meditation. This is discipline. This is mysticism. But it is by means of this that that which was of deity in the beginning, like the prodigal son, wanders through the illusions of the lower world and finally returns to his father's house. And we all come back because we are children of one father. We are children of one parent. We are parental offspring, sons and daughters of the infinite. And therefore, we all have the right to be brothers one and sisters one with each other and children to the eternal parents from which our existence is suspended. In those kind of thinkings, perhaps we can, you know, get back a little of that good-heartedness of childhood that we can remember dimly, but seemingly can no longer maintain as a way of life. Well, that's it, folks.